Final sponsor, our uh, friends at eyewitness.io, second year sponsoring as well, a lot of return sponsors, which is always amazing um, at a conference. And uh, this is a really awesome tool. It basically lets you monitor everything about your Laravel app, monitor your queues, schedules, the database, composer, uh, you know, your notification, all, all, all that stuff. You can write your own custom monitors, uh, which is really cool. So if you want to monitor like a third party service through it or like make a custom monitor for your disk space or some other server, uh, you could have all that into this one dashboard. Um, and then what's really amazing and is brand new is they now offer a self-hosted version. So this is something that we sell some self-hosted software and uh, the other part of our business. And uh, so if you want to download this and host it yourself, you can do that. It's totally free if you do that. So you can download it, install it, host it yourself, uh, and you know, monitor all your different applications. Totally free. The data is entirely on your server. Uh, and then if you do want to you know, outsource that aspect of it and run it as a SaaS, you know, it's very affordably priced, and they will run it all for you. So definitely check that out, eyewitness.io. Um, Definitely go into the digital swag. Uh, there they have 50% off um, the first invoice with them if you do go with the SaaS version. And it's just really a great product. Check it out. And thanks again for sponsoring again. Okay. Now, now we're ready. So let's do it. I will let you take it away, Matt. All right. Once you reshare your screen. Yeah. Let's see if this works. All right, y'all see Keep It Fun? Yes, we're good. Fantastic. All right, let's go. All right, so this right here is not actually what my grandma looks like. It's also not what my mom looks like because the story is more about my son than it is about me, so that would have been my mom. But I had this idea in my head of what science for grandma would look like, and that's what science for grandma looks like. So I'm going to tell you a little story. My son is awesome. He loved being on my podcast. So I have been doing the five minute geek show for years. And for the longest time at the end of every single geek show, I would have a little recording of him saying five minute geek show. And a lot of people have commented on the fact that you can hear him grow up through the years of the geek show, but I haven't done it for a while because I kind of ran out of things to ramble about on my own. And what I really wanted to do was interview other people, which is what Laravel podcast season three turned into. So one day he said, daddy, I want to have my own podcast. And I said, that's awesome. This kid's five. I said, well, what do you want to call it? What do you want it to be about? And he said, my keyboard shortcuts are not working. That's what he said. He said, I want to call it Stouffer's on Science. He said, I want to learn every little thing that I learned about science through my TV shows, Wild Kratz. I want to share the things I learned at school or whatever else. Little blips, bits and pieces here and there about everything. And since he's five, those little blips are things like wombat poop or bear butts. And these are five minutes at a time. His is actually a five minute show um, or less. And so they're really quick snippets, one or two a week, depending on how often I can get him to actually talk about something. Um, he even wrote and recorded his own theme song. And Ian and I tested, and you should be able to hear the audio for this. If not, I can put it up online later somewhere. So this is him. This is not the original one. The original one, really what happened was I said, hey, you need a theme song. And he's like, okay. And he just kind of wrote it and recorded it like in a sitting. This is a recreation, but I wanted you to be able to see kind of like what, what the awesomeness of this theme song looks like. Well, I guess I lied because I can't hear. Oh, you I can't hear it. Tested this, so well, just—it's okay. You guys can still watch the cuteness. All right. Watch this. Best part right there. So, what you need to do, just go to StouffersOnScience.com, listen to the first one, and you'll hear that, and you can kind of overlay what you're hearing with the cuteness that just happened right there. So that's that's fine. All right. So this podcast that we created is all DIY. It's all created just basically the, the minimum viable technology needed to make this thing happen. So every single time we're going to record a podcast, I just open voice memos on my phone and I kind of pointed at him a little bit. Most of them are in the car. I'm not even looking because I'm trying to be safe and driving my children. So I literally, before we get started, I say, hey, you, you, is there anything you want to do with on Science about? He says, yes. I hit the record button. I kind of hold it back, put it in his lap, and then I just drive. And then, you know, later I'll crop it out to something like that. I built his theme song by Googling free hip hop samples and just throwing them together in GarageBand. And I edit his actual episodes in GarageBand as well. Just super cheap, free, simple stuff. 
distributed. I put it on Simplecast, thought I was good. I put out a tweet, all that kind of stuff. I'll talk about all that later, but eventually I put it on Facebook. And then some older folks, you know, that I grew up with and my mom and my grandma were like, oh, how do I subscribe to a podcast? And it turns out that the majority of the world are not active, you know, avid podcast listeners, but are interested in my son being adorable. So what I wanted at this point, because I went, oh, well, crap, the, the primary target audience of this podcast is family and friends. So how am I actually going to make this viable for them? So what I really want, what I really, really, really want is the ability to send out a text message or a Facebook message or whatever else every single time there's a new episode. See, I, what I didn't want was to do what I did back here, where is, well, here's the technology and you, older person, adopt yourself and adapt yourself into the technology that I'm choosing to use to distribute this thing. Rather, what I want is to take the technology, let's go back over there, sparkles, and meet them where they are. Sometimes transitions are annoying. Okay, I want to, I want to reach them where they are. And so the question you ask then is, but how, Sway? And I'm, I tell you patience. We'll get into that in just one second. But that's just one quick story of what will kind of make sense together in the future. Right now, you might not know. So I'm just going to tell you a couple of little quick stories. And then I promise we'll get to the real meat of the talk and we'll kind of wrap them up together in just a minute. So here's another story. I was uh, doing a promotion for my book, uh, Laravel Up and Running.com. And uh, I got a whole bunch of people who signed up to be interested in this promotion. And then my editor said, okay, go pick 50. So, you know, being who I am, I said, I thought I'm a programmer. I can do this. So I import the CSV. I fetch 50 of them randomly. I, you know, uh, write them down to a specific format that my editor requested. I put it out to a CSV and then I email it to my editor. Well, I was traveling frequently. I think that's where this came from. And I found myself often wanting to know what's the best burger near me. So I thought I can do that. I'm a programmer. So I built this little thing where whatever goes before emergency.io, it's a that emergency. And so if you type in burger.mergency.io, you can either put your address or you can give, your, um, give it access to your browser location. And it shows you the closest and best rated burger shop or coffee shop or whatever else. Or you may not know this, but the 5-Minute Geek Show actually has a mortal enemy. It's my brother's podcast, the Mild Mildly Alarming Podcast, which is a podcast for people who are interested in designing board games. And so we are at war. And so a year or two ago, I built this little thing that allows you to kind of basically pick your side and roll some dice in the tiny little game. And I, you know, I thought hey, I'm a programmer, I can do that. Or we were sitting around thinking, I feel like it might've been at a Titan onsite or something, wouldn't it be fun to make a random generator for software as a service names? You know, everyone always says, well, my new app, it's Uber for whatever. So instead we, you know, built software as a service as a service. And I, I think it's still live at saasaas.titan.co. Um, and it just randomly generates them from some nouns. You know, and you know what, there's the same kind of thing. We had this idea and I thought, you know what? I can do that, I'm a programmer. It's this kind of consistent thing that I found. And each of these things would not be particularly possible and or viable without Laravel. Granted, there are plenty of other tech stacks that make these things technically possible, Rails and Node and Express and all these other kind of things, but very few would have put me in the position that I'm in right now where I actually would have built these things. So this is not a Laravel's better than the rest of the world, but I just wanna say Laravel puts me in a place, puts me in a position where those things happened and they wouldn't have otherwise. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So today we're talking about Laravel for fun and profit. And if you're not familiar with it, there's this kind of old timey phrase like needlework for fun and profit or, uh, you know, personal accounting for fun and profit. Um, but I will tell you the truth a little bit, which is I lied just a little bit. And there's one thing that's very similar about all the stories that I just told. And the one thing that's similar about them is that they're all fun, but no profit. They don't make any money. They were just for fun and they were just useful for a very small group of people. So I'm going to get into this for a little bit, but first I want to start with a theory. I have a theory to postulate for you, and I'm going to tell you more stories as we walk through this theory. My theory is about how we do and how we don't make applications and use specific technologies. The story begins with my whole life I've been making apps, but those apps never make me rich. My question has always been, how do I take these apps that I've built all these little side softwares or services, and I make some money off of them. And I'm asking these questions of how do I monetize Gistlog, for example? How do I monetize wrapping gists with a clean presentation layer? Well, I just built this because I was tired of reading blog posts in the gist interface. People kept writing these little mini blogs in the gist interface. It wasn't responsive. I'd pull up my phone. I'd literally have to scroll back and forth for every single line. It was miserable. So I built Gistlog. And of course, wonderful people helped me along the way. 
Symposium makes it easy for conference speakers to gather their bios and their talk abstracts together in one place. How do I make money off of that? Well, I built it because I wanted it. Um, and, you know, I've had some ideas, but they never really completely fit well with the goals of Symposium, which is to help conference speakers. Or the 5 Minute Geek Show, which is me just kind of ranting about random stuff. And plenty of times I've had advertisers offer me hundreds of dollars an episode. But imagine a five to 10 to 15 minute podcast with 30 seconds of ads for every podcast. It just doesn't line up with the values of the five minute key show. And so I just said no every time. Or Jiskus. Literally what it does is it says, GitHub Gists should notify you of comments, but they don't, so I'm gonna build it. And when I first built it, I actually did charge $5 a year, but I realized that was dumb and I stopped charging it and I put a little sponsored buy sign down at the bottom. Or Laravel Tricks. We, we bought Laravel Tricks a month ago. And the only changes we've been able to have time to make so far are change the colors, put the little from Titan line at the bottom, and then remove all the ads. We took something that was making enough money to pay off its you know, purchase for pretty quickly, and we just said, let's just make it stop making any money. We're still paying for the servers, not making any money. And it just turns out, I just don't care. I don't care about that. And this is what my common app development workflow looks like. I see a need. I imagine how to meet that need as simply as possible. I build the ugliest, simplest solution. I buy a domain, I throw it up on Forge, send out a tweet and never look back. Now granted, that's a little bit exaggerated, but only a little bit. Poor Adam Wathen. And this is what's tough about online conferences because when I spent time in Photoshop with Liquify tool building this, I was so excited to see and hear everybody responding to seeing this. And I realized I have no idea. Like my internet connection could be dead right now and I wouldn't even know. I don't get to see how much y'all are loving it, but I'm imagining in my head that you are all cracking up because this is so wonderful. Poor Adam joined Titan right around the time where I was deepest in my throes of build it, spit it out, keep moving. And we'd started Symposium around that time. And Adam said, oh, great, we're going to work on Symposium together. And what I did was throw out, um, you know, like a, like a database table, throw up a list page, an ad page, an edit page, a delete, you know, modal, and move on. And poor Adam was sitting here being like, well, can't we make it high quality and think about, you know, the user stories and all these very, very good and very, you know, valuable things. And I went, oh, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. And, you know, so he had to put it with me as I was learning to come away from this tendency at least a little bit and learn a little bit about how to, you know, slow down and, and go back to the thing and, and iterate on it. But this is something that I've done not just once, not just twice. Pulled over, symposium, confomo, Simple podcast site, smarter things, emergency, mark style. These are all applications that I built and launched and iterated on over time, but they've been out for anything between six months and, you know, four or five years and are still not done. It's just something that I do. And some of them never even get finished. Now, theoretically, they will one day, but Marvel Watch, Suggestive, Livestream Timeline, Keep It 140, Simple Podcasts that I mentioned, Smarter Things I mentioned, probably plenty more started and have never actually even launched. I used to feel bad about this, like I should be doing something different. I felt that my software as a service generally didn't make me money and they should. Similarly, I remember hearing, did you remember hearing about the guy who, when Dusk first came out, he paid his bills with Dusk? You know, I don't know about you, but I think my first response was, that's kind of cool, but there's also part of me that went, really? You know, you'd use your technology for this. That's so wasteful. Like you're going to waste your technology or something like that. And it made me think of this chart from XKCD. And if you haven't seen this before, it's basically how long can you justify spending on automating a given task based on how much time automating that task will save you over the next five years. So sometimes it does make sense to do this, but still there's that part of me that goes really right. And so I found myself thinking about this more and more often. What is this part of me that feels like I don't care, like I should be able to do this? And what is this part of me that goes, really, are you wasting your time on that? What are these two parts of me that are intention and why are they in intention and what part's right and what part's wrong? And I stopped and thought some moment in the last couple of months and I, I asked myself the question finally, why did I start coding? And the answer is, well, not to make money, that's for sure. I was in middle school. My dad had brought home this piece of software that, let you make websites for the internet. And it was basically, you know, the body tag, bold, italics, underline, image, I think. Um, you know, there was no CSS, there's no divs, there's no anything, there's no, I don't think there's JavaScript, I certainly didn't learn it. And I was like fascinated and it's just kind of gone from there. Coding is the hobby that I was able to turn into a job, not the other way around. And so it starts me asking these questions, why, what are the actual reasons that we write code? 
what if there are other reasons for why we write code other than some of the ones we might have been choosing? Or what are the reasons we build apps? What are the reasons we choose particular technologies? And DATH put out an article recently called Exiting the Dark Ages of Capitalism. He said, squeezing out every last dollar from a relationship will leave it sour and dry. It's a two-dimensional, flat, and antagonistic relationship. It's also frequently completely unnecessary and nearly always unsustainable. This really kind of struck with something within me, and especially having just heard Sandy's incredible talk and also thinking through my talk a couple of years ago about empathy, it's in what way are we relating to the people around us and, and for, for what purpose? And so for what reason are we building applications and what is our ongoing relationship with the users of our applications? And I, I started thinking something, and what I realized is that one of the things that we focus on the most and the encourage the most is people making apps outside of their day jobs to become successful, rich, famous, financially independent. So I, I wanted to say this, and if you're, if you're responding to this viscerally, just sit with it for a second because I'll explain a little more and give a caveat that'll probably make you feel better. But just because it doesn't make you rich and famous, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. So let's ask for a section, a second, what are the metrics that we most commonly use for deciding which apps to make? Right now, what motivates us to make side projects? What metrics do we use for these decisions? Some common reasons, and yes, I'm being a little bit hyperbolic, but it's worth thinking. It makes me money, makes me famous, gets me a job. It's usable by a large section of the company or the community in a traditional open source context. And these things make sense. These are fine motivations and lots of wonderful apps meet these criteria. I am not criticizing these things. I actually have a disclaimer that I forgot about. Making money, getting famous, getting a job, becoming financially independent, contributing to open source and any of the others, these other common motivations for building apps are perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with them. I have them, I'm proud to have them. But the thing is everyone knows that already. There's not a lot of people who are struggling with the understanding that you can make side apps to get rich if it's possible, to get financially independent if it's possible. But what about apps like Caleb Porzio at Titan who built a little dusk app to scrape Southwest so that he could get a little bit cheaper flights? You know, if I was being more idealistic, I'd say to go visit his family, but who knows? It was just a useful thing. What about Hire More Vets, which is a Laravel-based app to help hire veterans, help veterans get jobs? What about ReadMarvel.com, which makes it really easy to, to look at all the various Marvel comic books that are out there and make lists of your favorite and share them with your friends? What about the apps I mentioned earlier? Do those fit within those metrics? Not so much. And maybe there are some less common reasons that we should consider for building apps because it makes me laugh, it makes my kids laugh, it makes my friends laugh, it would be fun to build. I wanted to try out a fun idea. It would help me in a small way, it might help my spouse in a small way. And there's an idea that I wanna introduce here that is not exhaustive for this entire concept, but I think it's a worthy piece of the conversation, and this concept is human flourishing. And it basically introduces the concept of how is what we're doing helping other people? How are we enabling interactions with our code that would otherwise be impossible? And then the reason that for that is, is human flourishing is a state where people experience positive emotions, positive psychological functioning, and positive social functioning most of the time, living within an optimal range of human functioning. So it's basically when everything is good and working for us and we are healthy and happy and doing well, that's human flourishing. And so obviously I could be super idealistic and ideological right now about, oh, our apps make the world better, but in some ways they can. But better doesn't always have to mean that you're saving the dolphins or whatever. It also can mean you're making someone laugh. And these are all valid things for us to consider when making apps. Two just little examples in my life. Um, I wanted to share photos of my uh, newly born daughter a year, well, 18 and a half months ago. Um, and m part of my family uses Facebook, part of my family uses Google for everything, part of my family uses um, Apple for everything. And we couldn't get a single place where I could put photos, not make it exposed to the whole internet because it's, you know, like babies in the bath and that kind of stuff, um, but actually make it accessible to my whole family. It actually turns out to be a very difficult thing for me to do. And so I built this tiny little app where you email um, your photos in, it takes the e photos, it puts them in a list, only certain people can see the list and they get notified. Or this other one pulled over where Sandra Bland had gotten pulled over and she ended up not surviving the incident after being pulled over by a police officer. And my wife looks very similar to Sandra Bland. And um, I worry about her in a lot of the same ways that Sandra Bland's family, you know, did worry about her beforehand. So I thought, what can I do to help my wife and other people like her when they're pulled over feel more confident? I feel like, hey, I'm a programmer. I can do it, right? So you call this phone number. It saves the voicemail down to Twilio. And then it had saved all your, um, your text, your, the, the, the phone numbers for your close friends and family. And it sends them a link with the recording afterwards. 
right? And so we're using Laravel for lots of things, for fun, right? We're using it to do things that you couldn't without it. We're enabling a better, fuller life with Laravel, and we're, we're using Laravel for human flourishing. And again, this is not saying these are the only valid rules. I'm not saying that, oh, and therefore using Laravel to make money is a bad thing. No, like making money allows you to live the life with your family you want. Make, making money allows you to flourish. You know, like those are not bad things, but I want to add this onto our list of things that we consider. And in the same ways, we should also consider how we evaluate not just the apps that we build, but the technologies that we're using, the tools that we're using. So there's so many technologies coming at us all the time, and we can often just get fatigue, new technology fatigue. How am I going to handle all these individual things that are kind of like coming at me? And so we tend to be very protective in terms of not adopting new tech unless it kind of can prove itself. How would you respond if I told you I'm doing a chatbot talk? I actually asked this question to some people in um, the Titan Slack. One said, I admit to having a hard time with the chatbot part, but that's, part, that's perhaps because of my very visceral negative reaction to the whole concept of a chatbot. And the other one said, when I heard you were talking about chatbots, I had this weak inner reaction. This doesn't sound like something interesting, but Matt gives good talks. So, hey, and that was me too. It was. I thought, oh, okay, one, one new tech that I have to learn. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever. And then while I was working on this talk, while I was building this Science for Grandma app, I had Marcel Potziot on the Laravel podcast. And this is what happened. <laughs> you see, you just blew my mind because he started talking about how using chatbots, uh, I think it was TechCrunch is able to send, to take preferences about what his favorite subjects are. And then every night send him a quick kind of like highlight of what the, the news of the day was relative to the things he's interested in. I said, wait a minute. I can use that to send Facebook messages to old people and my grandma and my mom or whatever about my son's latest podcast. And side note, uh, Marcel uh, creates Botman, which is the simplest way. And again, we'll go into this a little bit later, but he also just released a video course that I have used to help me do this. So botman.io for that. Okay. So common reasons, just like we did common reasons we build apps. Let's talk about common reasons we tend to adopt technology. My clients are asking for it right now. Clients will ask for it. I can use it to build an app that will bring me money and fame or whatever else, or I can apply it on apps I'm currently running, or maybe it'll simplify or replace part of my currently used techs, a tech. Here's some other ones we might want to consider as well now. It'll let my grandma do something cool. I can talk with my dog using it. My daughter can use it to play her favorite game. My spouse will totes appreciate it, or OMFG, I feel like a wizard. Real quick interlude. Turns out, I've learned in figuring this all out, that speed is very important. Remember, a couple of years ago at Laracon US, I gave a talk called um, Leveraging Laravel, Launching Side Projects Quickly with Laravel. It was about rapid application development, about how Laravel is a rapid application development framework. And I walked through idea, implementation, and then deployment for some of my ideas. Um, some of, and, for, and I think I did it on, on Giscus. And so... Keep that in the back of your head as I, I walk through the next couple of slides. When you saw this XKCD graph, where it talks about the amount of time that is acceptable to spend on something where it's actually a good automation, was the takeaway that you got from this, less things are worth automating than I thought, right? Because that's how I, I, I saw this as a corrective. Hey, geek who's saying you're automating away 30 seconds a day and spent 15 days doing it, like slow down, that might not be as, you know, you were using this as a justification. Well, it turns out that there's another takeaway you can get that I like a lot more. And when I got this takeaway, it totally blew my mind, which is the faster I can build applications, the more things I can justify building. Because remember, it's this kind of like little diagonal thing here, right? So the faster I build, the more apps sit within that sweet spot, right? Totally blew my mind. And this is why I love some of the tools we have available to us. Valet, Lambo, Eloquent, the Laravel front-end presets, Tailwind, or auto-wiring, route model binding, route slash console.php, service discovery, ignoring type hints, ignoring return type hints, real-time facades. All of these things allow me to make more things because more things are justifiable to spend my time on because I'm faster. I love it. And what I found is these simple things that I'm building often have one of two shapes. One of them is this one, which is basically 
a whole bunch of database tables with some relationships and some CRUD or close to CRUD interaction. That's basically Excel and access plus maybe some custom views and actions hosted on the cloud, shareable among your friends, five bucks a month. And I've built quite a few of those. Karani is actually financially successful. Smarter Things, Symposium, Mark Style, those are just out there for free. And then there's a different shape. And the second shape is the other simplest Laravel app where it takes some other source of data, likely with very little actual user interaction, and it just responds to it. Marvel Watch says, based on some very little bit of customer configuration, here are the Marvel series I want to keep up on updates for. Watch for when new updates come to those um, entries in the Marvel Online, which is this basically subscription version of Marvel stuff, and then send a message if that happens. Simple podcast site consumes the RSS from a podcast and generates a simple cast style landing page for it. Jiskus literally just goes to all your gists, checks for new comments and notifies you if they're there. So you did one thing. You said, sign up. That's about it. Maybe sign up and here's my favorite, you know, uh, Marvel comics. And that's all you had to do. The primary work that this is doing is consuming something on a regular basis, checking, notifying. So once more, it's story time. And I'm going to talk a little bit more through how I built Science for Grandma. So I walked through this before. I'm going to walk through it again. And we're going to get a little bit further into how these tech decisions and how these app decisions impact us as I walk once again through the process of deciding to go from, you know, my son saying I want a podcast to what I've actually ended up building. So first, I put it in Simplecast. Software's on science, 10 bucks a month, great. Then I publish it in Apple Podcasts, and I think, I'm good. Now I'm just going to tell a whole bunch of people about it to get it in their favorite podcatcher or whatever, and I'm good to move forward. Then I announce it on Twitter, and then the response is great. People love it. They love the yeah, baby. They think it's amazing. One guy actually designed this amazing new logo, which is way better than what I've made. This is a great response. Go put it on Facebook, and just like I said before, record scratch. <laughs> How do I just subscribe to this? So for a while, I just said, well, you know, those people are just going to have to have to deal with it. And they're going to have to learn how to uh, deal with the podcast, you know, subscription, you know, app or whatever. And I just thought about it. I'm like, that's not a good fit. So of course I did what I always do, which is Lambo. So I went Lambo Stauffers on Science. And I said, Lambo, if you're not familiar with it, is basically Laravel new, but with even more time saved. Um, and so I said, well, what are the things I want to enable? And I wanted to talk longer on this, but I feel like if I talk you through all the steps of building this app, um, I'll either talk way too fast or it'll go way too long. So I kept this short, um, but I think you can kind of fill in between the lines. So first thing I did was I said, well, in order to go, somebody's probably going to go to the subscribe page and pick to subscribe via SMS or Facebook. So I gave them, you know, two buttons in the homepage, SMS or Facebook. And for SMS, it takes their phone number and subscribes them. For Facebook, originally, there's a button that says subscribe on Facebook. That didn't work. I'll tell you why in a second. And I said, okay, well, now what? Well, once they hit those buttons, we got to save them somewhere. Well, I should have created a subscriptions table, but because I was being lazy and fast, sorry, Adam, I just modified the users table to have a phone number and a Facebook ID, both nullable. So if you've got a phone number, you're a phone number subscription. If you've got a Facebook ID, you're a Facebook subscription. And then I said, okay, I need to parse the RSS and send out notifications for all of them. So I created a real quick artisan command. And this was much faster because I just did this in, you know, in, in a closure rather than having to actually spin up a new class for it. And much faster, you know, I saved 20 seconds, but I also saved mental kind of weight. I said, pull all of the feed items using simple pie from my RSS URL. Um, wrap them in a collection, reject any of those that I've already cached locally. And caching locally just means save it in a database with the, 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 the GUI, I think it's called, so that I can not set, resend a notification for that same episode. For all that remain after the rejection, save the GUID locally so we don't re-notify, and then send a single job out that says notify subscribers a new episode. All right, go to that job. It goes through all your users. And it, well, not all users. It just sends a single notification to the collection of all users, and it sends that collection of all users, each individually, a new episode released notification. And if you remember my rapid application development talk, you'll remember that this is a very similar shape to what I did with Jiskus, which is part of why I'm not spending as much time walking through it, because you can go watch that talk and see a lot of the same details. One command happens on a regular basis, pulls some data, checks which ones are actually notifiable, performs a notification action on the ones that are notifiable. 
So then that notification, well, this is a multi-channel notification, which if you have never had the opportunity to work with multi-channel notifications in Laravel, it's really incredible the things it allows you to do. This is the simplest possibility where you're just saying there's two different options, Twilio or Facebook. Twilio for SMS, Facebook for Facebook Messenger. So each of those just creates a new instance of whatever the message type is for that particular notification channel. And then you have to decide for the given notif notifiable, which is user in this context or subscription, which channel do I use? So I just said, well, I want to offload that to the user, right? So I just said notifiable notification channel. Okay, great. And the user defines what its notification channel of preference is. Phone number, if it's got a phone number, return the Twilio one. If it's got a Facebook ID, return the Facebook one, throw an exception otherwise. Great. So now it's going to iterate over all of them. It's going to send a notification for each one. It's going to pull whether it's a Twilio notification or a Facebook notification, and it's going to send them all off quick and clean. And let's pause for just a second and appreciate the wonderful resource that is Laravel-notification-channels.com, where there's this huge collection of non-standard, so non-out-of-the-box notification channels that you can use to send your notification channels to things like Facebook and to Twilio and to, you know, push bullet or whatever else, but also really interesting things like you can add tasks to Trello using this, or you can literally send physical mail using this. There's a lot of amazing opportunities here. So I pulled down both of them. First, I hooked into Twilio, or Twilio. You add it to configservices.php. You add it to your .env. You compose or acquire it. And then, of course, I had to go get those credentials. So I made a sample project, put 20 bucks on it, grabbed the API keys, put them in my env, and that was it. Those steps, put it in the config, put it in the env, require the actual notification channel, and put re real values in there and instantly those notifications were sending the text messages. It's actually kind of terrifying how quickly you can go from nothing to sending real text messages to real phone numbers. Facebook, let's get moving, do the same kind of thing. Put it in configservices.php, put it in the .env file, great, compose or require literal, no literal notification channel slash Facebook, but wait a minute. You can't just send a message to somebody just given their Facebook ID. Well, first of all, you got to get it somewhere. But second of all, you probably need something to give some sort of permission, right? But let's just figure out what would you use to get social authentication information in Laravel? You'd use Socialite, right? So I hooked it up with Socialite, hit login, grabbed their information, got them. The auth flow was amazingly easy. Thank, thank you, Taylor, for Socialite. It comes back. I have a Facebook ID. I save the Facebook ID. I try to authenticate. Turns out it's not possible. This is because the Facebook ID is app scoped, which means I just got a Facebook ID that is viable for the login app, but not the send messages app. So it didn't work. So what Facebook ended up telling me was you need to initialize that subscription from within Facebook, the messaging app. So instead I changed that original signup page and said, instead of clicking this button, so easy, I instead said, click this button to go over to the messaging conversation view on Facebook with Staffers on Science page and type the word subscribe. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm entering into chatbot world here a little bit, but I'm going to keep hacking on in my way because I don't need to learn about chatbots. <laughs> and then I'm basically building a chatbot by hand. Anyway, you look at this code. If you're, you're throwing out requests, you don't even know what they are. You're digging down into, you know, array, uh, under an array, under an array, the first of that, and the array under that, and the first of that, and throwing away things, and not really even sure how to message back when something happens, but eventually, I got this working. It functions. All right, put it online, and then I go to Facebook, and I apply for it, and I get the submission in, and then, wow, didn't work. Turns out it needs interactivity. And what they want is the ability for me to send a message and then them to send a different message and still get a message back. And so let's say I say, go send subscribe and they go and they type info or help or hello. Well, mine wouldn't do anything. So I now need to modify this code and make it handle all these different contracts. And I went, nope, not gonna happen. And that's when I pulled in Botman. It turns out when you need it, Botman is fantastic. Having access to it and understanding a Botman is key. So very simply, oh, sorry, I, I like this because of enter bot man. Um, this is, anyway, um, sorry. So with bot man, I took what was that big complicated piece of code and I just basically bot man hears. It's like a routes file where I'm defining the routes for hearing hi or hello. I'm, I'm hearing the routes for info. I'm hearing the routes for subscribe or unsubscribe. And so the original one was much simpler, but adding the other ones was also a lot simpler. And if, if I had not done that podcast and 
had a moment on the podcast where my conception of how to evaluate tech was changed, I probably would have just given up or still been sitting there hacking that crappy piece of code. But when I allowed myself to say my concept that chatbots are not viable and worthy um, might not be right, um, then it turned out it was brilliant. And that doesn't mean, okay, the, the purpose of my talk is that chatbots are great. The purpose of my talk is that, well, lots of things, but the, the, the key point we're in right now is that um, there are things worth thinking, the technology is worth considering and using where we, using our normal metrics, um, might limit it down to how I'm gonna use it for work. But um, I'm sure one day I'll figure out how to use Botman for work, but right now, opening up the scope of even asking the question of what am I going to use it for allowed me to do this thing that I probably would not have actually functionally done before. And so I resubmitted the application. It got accepted by Facebook. Everybody's getting their messages. Boom. And just for fun, I uh, made it so that every single time you, um, a new episode comes out, the carriage lights in the front of my house flash three times. And I will, um, I'll show you more about that in just a second. But essentially what happens is that every single time that job runs about, which I was talking about, the job being the um, notify users of new episode or whatever else it being, it first sends out all those notifications. And just underneath that, it says basically this code right here. Uh, in the actual code, I think I ended up using Guzzle, but you can see here I use, I use ZTTP because I didn't have, I don't know, anyway, ZTTP is better. But, um, and so I send a post. Again, I'll talk more about this in a second. And I just said, flash it blue three times. Great. And future ideas. There's many, plenty of other things I can do now that I have this chatbot available to me. I can tweet from at Stauffer Science. Every single time there's a new post, I definitely should build that. Um, I can listen for Facebook messages in the chatbot saying, hey, can you give me a suggestion of some videos that little man can watch? You know, one of his best episodes comes from someone who just spontaneously sent him some videos, right? That's awesome. Um, or maybe, here's an idea. Every time there's an episode out, put it into a queue and let him press this actual button. And that's what releases the episode. Or maybe give him a text message address that he can text, I guess, MMS. We can text science pictures that'll auto post to his Twitter and his website, something like that. There's so many things I could do. So there's all these different technologies that we often underestimate. And this is not an exhaustive list, but this is a few interesting examples where it's things that reach people in their everyday lives, in the real world, Facebook and SMS, iOS and Android apps, Internet of Things, or all the rest of those Laravel notification channels. And just for fun, I'm going to show you a couple of just fun examples of way people, people have used their programming in such a way where it doesn't really provide them any financial benefit, but it's just for fun. First of all, my friend Greg Bagas, who works at Twilio, built this little thing, and it's in Python, but whatever, you could have done it in, in Laravel if you want, where his dog presses the red button, takes a picture of his dog, and it texts it to him. I love it. I really want to build something like that where my son, when he's thinking of me or he has a question or something like that, can send me like a little message. We build a little computer or an interface, something like that. I don't know. I just feel like that'd be super cool. Marcel, who I talked about earlier, figured out how to deploy his Laravel Forge sites using his voice. And so let's say you've got one of those little echo dots sitting next to your computer. Maybe there's a whole series of commands that you want to run based on what you're doing. Then instead of this, or instead of everybody having a shell script and the shell script's not being in sync, maybe everybody has an echo dot and you normalize your things that way. I don't know. It's just an interesting idea. Or maybe you want to accept voicemails for something. Well, I might want to set up voicemails for my son's podcast. Well, I could pay a whole bunch of money to some voicemail service, or I could go to Twilio Studio and build that whole thing, or I can use that bod podcast's um, voicemail app. I think it's like a slim app, and you basically just set up a phone number, hook it into whatever the provider is, and they call, leave a voicemail, and the voicemail gets delivered to you in an S3 bucket somewhere as an MP3. You can get started with Internet of Things really easily. You can see these four, these are my favorites just because they're so simple. And so the first one on the right there is this flick button where you basically, it connects only to your iPhone app, F-L-I-C, and you can tell it to do all sorts of things based on click, double click, or hold. And one of my favorites is you can tell it to ping a particular webhook URL when you do one of those things. And so this button can trigger access to all sorts of interesting web-based things. The AWS IoT button is the same idea, but it's more complicated and it's more work. The LifeX lights, you notice that there's one right there. Um, for those who you didn't notice, I, I flashed a URL um, that is blink.mattstaufer.com. And if you go there, you can actually, you know, click buttons and make it flash colors. The way that one works is that LifeX connects to Wi-Fi, connects to the LifeX app, connects to if this and that, and I build a tiny little website that sends pings to that. And then Keith Damiani made it way prettier. 
and uh, Jake Bathman made it a little bit better for me too. Or there's this little little guy, who, which is the Blink One Mark II, which is like a little tiny USB light where you can do that same kind of programming with it. All sorts of very affordable ways for you to have physical interactions between you and the computer or you and the web app or the web app and your world around you. I actually wrote a blog post, Controlling LifeX, X, uh, LifeX Lights with your Laravel or other web application, talking very simply about how to connect your application to if this, then that, and if this, then that to LifeX. And you're seeing it happen in real time as people go nuts all over this thing, but I recorded this when it was my first time ever, and I was so excited. The only thing you're missing audio-wise is I say, boom, baby. So I hit enter, and my lights are changing on my actual house. It was brilliant. There's all sorts of clever and incredible things we can do. And, and take a look at these ones. If this, then that, and Zapier, they have dozens, hundreds probably of integrations. Every single app you ever build can talk to if this, then that, or can receive webhooks from this, then that, if this, then that. Every single web app you ever build could talk to Zapier or receive webhooks from Zapier. So the amount of things you can do, the possibilities are endless. It's incredible the things that we can do. So we're almost done. What change can I make today? right? That's always the thing you should do. What is the actual reason I sat here and listened to this guy talk for 40 minutes other than flashing a light, all sorts of interesting colors and clicking the button enough times to try and see if I can crash his server? What would you actually, what should you, what I, what I want you to walk away with? Well, there's four main things that I talked about. First of all, change your perspective of what's worth building. Just expand it a little bit. Don't get rid of the things you already think are worth building. Just add on to it a little bit. Change your perspective of what is worth using. When you consider a new technology, don't just think about how it's going to work for your clients or your business. Think about whose life you could make different and better. What does it look like to really, you know, use that tech in a creative and innovative way? Change your perspective of what you're capable of. You're not just a coder. You can interact with the real world and the real world can interact with you. And work for human flourishing and fun. Don't just work for your success. And again, you can work for human flourishing by making a lot of money and, you know, having a great life or taking care of your family or whatever. Those things are not bad, but also just kind of bring these thoughts into it. Work for fun. Recognize the power that we have as programmers to change other people's lives. We're not just sitting here, code monkeys, just typing up code and building, you know, sales sites. We have the opportunity to actually impact people's lives and we have power and we have tools available to us that a lot of other people don't. How can we use those tools in these positive ways? So one last thing, there's a mantra. I don't actually know if that's the correct use of this word that I want you to walk away with. And it is, I can do that. I'm a programmer. Remember, that's what I said every single time. I, I found myself in a situation and I said, I can do that. I'm a programmer. I'm a programmer. I can do that. I want you to internalize that. When you find yourself in situations where you see a need, whether it's a fun and silly need or an idea that would just tickle somebody and it would just be this clever little idea. I mean, I built that thing in, well, it was originally 20 minutes, but then we kept making it better and better and better. But because it'd be fun. Because it'd just be like, a, it, next time you find yourself in that setting, say, I can do that. I'm a programmer. I'm a programmer. I can do that. And get to the point where there are less things in the way. More things fall in that, that XKCD kind of quadrant or whatever. It's half... Well, that, anyway, it's section where it is actually within the, the realm of things worth doing with your time. That's it. Uh, I don't know if I have questions, but that is it for the talk. So thank you very much. That was great. Love it. Thank you. Totally agree. I think that's been something that's been so lost in um, modern times with your tech crunches and all this stuff is like, all this programming has to be for like a purpose and it just can't be for fun yeah. or, or even something you thought was for a purpose that maybe you even just get halfway through and stop. Like, cause it's such a, yeah. focus. you got the ship and you have to finish. And like, maybe you don't have to finish. Like I built 30 things before I finished anything or was successful. Yeah. At anything, and none of them were finished at all. So, yep. and those things all had, were useful in the end. Ultimately now I see that how useful those things were, uh, yeah. that I half built. So yeah, exactly. Uh, Taking, like, taking those risks to uh, just try something. And, yeah. And yeah, I think it's great. And uh, uh, we were setting off your light, which was awesome. I got it. It's I a ton of fun. Internet of things. Yeah, speaking of which, if you um, go check out my Twitter, after this, I'll link out my uh, slide deck. I'll link out the code base that does that. And I'll link out the code base for that podcast subscriber app that I built. None of them are like done. 
surprise, but they're all in a place where if somebody was interested in it, you know, they could do it. And also tweet out links to maybe like the cheapest light you can get in the cheapest button or something. Just so if anybody's interested, go check out my Twitter over the next hour. So I uh, do that. We'll retweet it up on Laracon online and all that too. And uh, I'll, I'm going to be buying a few of those because your exact case. I was like for the kids, like that'd be awesome just during the day to have them like yeah. send me a light flash. Yeah, that. exactly. Like, and especially for kids too, to make that real. Like I've tried talking to my kids about the programming several times, but I haven't really clicked with them yet. Cause it's like yep. work and it's so abstract and yeah. yeah so oh yeah. And work too. Yeah. 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 It's not, it's just not in the work. It's the abstraction. And uh, I think that like making a light bulb shine, is going to be the kind of thing that, you know, could, might capture their imagination. So yeah, for sure. Well, that's great. Um, all right. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one.